So hey guys, this is Raymond and today we're going to talk a little bit about um, home defense, right? So this is, a, this is a project that I've been bouncing off in my head for a while, is how we adapt Filipino martial arts for home defense. Uh, the thing is, you know, uh, and this has become very uh, prevalent in people's minds during the pandemic because, you know, everyone's staying at home, right? Uh, I remember in the past, I used to do a lot of um, self-defense workshops, and uh, a lot of it is what we would call like street self-defense in the sense that you are being attacked on the street, right? Typically, it's when you are um, going from one point to another or when you're going from work to your home. Or from home to work or whatever that that travel time is when you're really vulnerable um, and that's when a lot of attacks happen and that's what people experience right um, but because of the pandemic um, you know pe people are working from home and people are starting to realize like hey I'm spending so much time in my home uh, and being very self-defense oriented people they start thinking like oh how do I defend myself at home so this is a good, this is a very interesting topic for me, and I'll be exploring a lot of ideas in some videos. I, I think this is going to be a video series. In my mind, this is probably going to be like a three-part series or a four-part. I'm not sure yet. Depends on how, shake, how things shake out. Because the more I learn about the topic, the more it grows in my head, right? Uh, like I said, this is a fairly new ground for me. Um, so yeah, if anybody out there is watching this video um, and you have experience with home defense and um, static security um, and you have uh, a link that's going to be helpful for me, yeah, uh, put it in the comments or whatever, guys. Um, I'm really open to learning more about this. So right now, I'm not going to go into the moves yet. Um, in my experience in self-defense, the moment you have to apply violence, there's a lot of things that have gone wrong already and there were steps that you missed uh, so that now violence becomes necessary so um, in this first video what we're going to talk about is the things that can prevent a home uh, you know you having to use violence to defend your home right so as with any kind of self-defense um, awareness is the first part right um, you know uh, as they say, charity begins at home, self-defense begins outside of your home, outside of yourself. And it's especially true with home defense. So what i like you guys to imagine is um, different uh, spheres that are sm becoming smaller and smaller. While where the smallest, smallest part of the sphere uh, is you and your home, right? You, your home, your family. Right? And even that, you can get smaller, right? Like your family, your home, and you, or you, your home, your family, right? So that's the things that you want to protect. So that's the smallest part of the sphere, right? As you go outside, then this is just your neighborhood, right? And then you go outside, that's like your, your general area, and if you go outside, it's your country, and if you want to get bigger, this is the whole world, right? And um, let me talk to you guys through this. So if you go to the outside, right? which is, let's talk about the biggest part, which is the national level, right? You have to be, you have to take into consideration what country you're in, right? What kind of laws are in your country? What are the self-defense laws in your country, right? Because what is true for someone in the U.S. will not be true for, might not be true for someone in the Philippines, and something that might be true in the Europe um, may or may not be true for someone in, say, Korea or Japan. Thailand or whatever uh, so every country has their own laws uh, and even bigger than laws is every country has their own values right what they prize um, in their community right uh, in, in a lot of places like in America you know you have that whole rugged individualism kind of um, culture where a guy defending himself and what he owns you know, you have this image of the, the pioneers uh, going out there and protecting what's theirs, right? They have that whole mentality, which affects how they think about things, about all their laws and everything, and even how their laws are applied, right? So 
here in the Philippines, there's this whole big sense of community, right? And societal hierarchy, right? Um, which kind of defines who and who you can't fight uh, to a certain extent. Um, and who are the people you're appropriate to fight and not to fight. It's a weird situation. Um, so you have that, right? The values that you have, and then you narrow it down to the country and the, the, the bones of it, which is the laws. What are the self-defense laws? What do you have to pay attention to, right? And then when you get even smaller to your community, then you think, what kind of community am I living in? Am I in a location that is very rural where, um, you know, am I in a province that's very rural where the most danger that's going to come uh, is probably going to come from nature, right? It's going to come from wild animals or something like that. While someone who is in a more urban area, right, in a more urban sphere, danger is probably going to come from another person, right? Um... And you have to take into account those things, the character of where you're living in, the laws. And it gets smaller and smaller until you get to around the neighborhood sphere, right? Neighborhood sphere, you know, you have to understand what kind of neighborhood you're living in. Are you in an affluent neighborhood that has 24-hour um, security? Are you in a less affluent neighborhood where, but still, you know, pretty close to a police station so that, you know, as we know, there's like a radius around the police station and it makes criminality kind of less, um, less common in that area, right? So you might be in a less affluent community, but you're near a police station, um, or you might be in a very tight-knit community, right? That doesn't see a lot of people um, from outside of the community coming in. You know, you see a lot of this in the provinces here in the Philippines. Uh, where they would know if someone comes in who isn't part of the community, right? Uh, is your community like that? Or is it more an urban place? Or are you in a condominium um, setup? You know, it's a multi-story building. Uh, you have 24-hour uh, security, but you don't know who your neighbors are. Maybe you know the people in the next unit, but you don't really know everyone in the whole building. And that is actually one of the things you have to pay attention to, like, how tight is the community? Where is the protection coming from in the community? Is the protection coming from the police? Is it coming from personal security? Um, you know, uh, security force that is hired, or is it coming from the community members watching out for each other? Right. And what I would argue, and this is probably the part of the sphere where you can do something about the situation, because when it comes to laws and values and app, you know, and the general lawlessness or whatever of your area you, you you have very little control over that you know your average person has very little control of that but in the narrow sphere in your neighborhood you might have a little bit of control in the sense that you should be creating connections and networks within your community right so like in the example that i gave if you live in a condominium and you have 24-hour security that might be enough, right? Or it might not be enough, right? How do you increase that sense of security? You increase that by connecting with your neighbors, right? So that if someone is, like for example, if you know everybody on your floor, right? Everybody's your friend, you've had dinner with uh, everyone on your floor at least once. I don't know if you can do that. But you know, you know everyone. So when somebody comes in, right? You can talk to them directly, like say, hey, I don't know who you are, but who are you looking for? And then if they say, that, oh, I'm looking for Mrs. So-and-so, and this is, person is not on your floor, you can see how you can be suspicious immediately. Like, hey, oh, dude, I don't know there's a, if there's a Mrs. Cruz on this floor. What floor are you going to? And then if the guy goes, oh, I don't know, you know I'm going on this floor. Oh, yeah, what you did? Right? So you get that, like, if you're part of the community, you know the community more, and dangers that come, can come from outside of the community is something that is easier for you to spot and easier for your neighbors to spot, right? Like, if someone is snooping at your door, your neighbors can go, hey, dude, how do you know Raymond, who's living in this apartment unit? And the guy goes, oh, yeah, I'm his brother. And then the guy goes, no, 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 I met his brother. That's not you. They can start calling the security. You know what I'm saying? That uh, by strengthening your connection to the community, 
you actually increase your personal security. And then you, there's a synergistic effect where you also increase the security for other people um, in your community. Right? So that's something that's uh, definitely worth thinking about. Right? In, in some places, there are some official channels where you can do that. Um, you know, some people have um, barangay volunteers um, where you can volunteer at your local barangay to help with the local security. Um, you can be a tanod if you have the time to, to be one. Um, or at least befriend the tanod. Like, know, understand and know who these guys are. Right? Um, and see what, the, what kind of security your tanods can provide. Right? So a lot of us who live in barangays, you know, you've seen the tanods before. Uh, for those who don't know what the tanods are, tanods are... The closest I can imagine is like the deputies in the U.S. Because the, the barangay captain, who is the head of the tanods, he's kind of like a sheriff in the sense that he's law enforcement, but he's elected, right? Um, while the, the tanods are, you know, the deputies are kind of um, keep the peace. But these guys are not supposed to be armed. Like they, they are armed with sticks, batons, um, that's about it. Uh, they are not officially allowed to have uh, a firearm, or they're not allowed, they are not issued a firearm by the government. Uh, there are so many cases, though, where barangay tanods carry their own personal firearm, the legality of which I'm not 100% sure about. But anyway, so that's what the tanods are, right? People who, it's like more than the neighborhood watch, definitely, but less than the police force. It's a, it's, a, it's a weird point in between the two. Um, so if, if you're close to the Tanods in your community, that's great. You can see what kind of training that they have. You know, do these guys look professional? Because I've met some Tanods from some really good uh, barangays where they get uh, a lot of training. Uh, like they have first aid training. They actually have defense training, which is surprising. Uh, but, you know, they're not very adequate. I mean... It's better than nothing, but anyway, that's another video, I think. Um, but yeah, you, you can understand the level of training that these guys have, so and know, so you know how much you can depend on them, is what I'm saying, right? So you have that community level of defense, right? Um, am I missing something there? I think I've covered everything about community. Um, then you get to the smaller space, right? So after community, there's just the neighborhood and whatever. Um, and then it gets smaller and smaller. And a lot of it depends on the, the, the way your area is structured. So let me give you guys an example from my personal experience, right? Um, so I live in a neighborhood, in a neighborhood, right? And then outside of the neighborhood, there's a barangay outside of it. Because my barangay is huge. <laughs> it's a pretty big barangay, uh, and it, I think it, it's divided into three or four parts, I think. Um, but anyway, and each part has its own character, uh, but we're all part of the same barangay that's being managed by the same tanods. That being said, um, my area is not frequented by the tanods uh, because um, it's not as necessary. Right? The population density in my neighborhood is not that big. The population density in some other places are higher, so that's where the tanods go. Um, yeah, they have to maximize their, their use, right? So you have that situation for me. For some people, it's not even that, right? So they have their barangay, and then they have their condo unit with a security, and then homeowners association. In some places, it's that are smaller, it's just the barangay, and that's it. Your barangay is your neighborhood. Right, so I don't know what your situation is, but you, you know you adapt the idea uh, in your own space, um, and then after that, then you get to the home, right? And I think I'm gonna leave this off for another video, <laughs> uh, because this one uh, this one expands a little bit. The topic expands a little bit when you go to your home. All right, so I hope this video hasn't been too rambly. I hope you guys uh, understood what I was talking about. Uh, if you guys have any input on some of the ideas that I just um, expressed uh, when it comes to home defense, uh, I, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'd appreciate uh, being pointed in the right direction. 
All right, so have a good day, guys, and I hope to hear from some of you soon, and I hope I can come out to the next video uh, as soon as possible.